As ASCP continues our series highlighting the work medical laboratories are doing to combat COVID-19, we visit the University of Nebraska Medical Center in Omaha, Nebraska. In the first of a two-part episode, ASCP CEO Dr. E. Blair Holliday speaks with Dr. Peter Iwin, director of the Nebraska Public Health Laboratory housed on the university's campus. Dr. Iwin and Amanda Bartling, molecular laboratory technologist, gives us an extraordinary behind-the-scenes look inside this unique biocontainment laboratory and how samples are tested for the novel coronavirus. And I have the distinct honor to be standing next to Dr. Peter Iwin, who is the director of the Nebraska Public Health Laboratories. Dr. Iwan, thank you for joining us today. Yeah, it's my pleasure, and, and I welcome you to, to the uh, University of Nebraska Medical Center campus. Um, one of the um, unique uh, sides of our program is that our public health lab in the state of Nebraska is actually located on the university campus. And what this allows for us to do is it allows us to have interaction with the, not only the scientists on the campus, but it also allows us to be incorporated into the academic programs of the university. Um, I am a university employee. What it does for the state is it allows the state to have access to uh, like an academic hospital laboratory so that we can combine our resources and, and this leads into uh, less cost for testing. We don't duplicate tests that they might run in their laboratories. The University of Nebraska had the foresight to get way ahead of this curve when they opened a biocontainment facility for both Ebola and now, obviously, we're using it for, right. for coronavirus. But I'd like your perspective on the role of biosafety engineers here on campus right. and what they're doing and how that plays into the perspective of containing this virus and supporting public health. When it comes to safety, I think we all recognize when you're in the laboratory world that that is something that the administration has to provide for our employees. Anytime a new pathogen shows up, you know, it's, it's a complete new world of what is it we do. Whatever we do in the laboratory, it's done safely, that our, our employees are safe, that the public is safe. And we've dealt from extremes. We've gone from Ebola, we've gone with, you know, influenza has always been around, but now we're actually getting into something completely new, which is coronavirus. You recently just published in the American Journal of Clinical Pathology on this very uh, issue around biocontainment. Tell me a little bit about that and the history of your scientific review in the past and how that prepared right. Nebraska for this current pandemic. Well, as this new virus shows up, coronavirus, of course, Again, I'm getting people calling me from all over the state saying, how can we handle these specimens in the laboratory? And I thought, you know what, we did this before, let's do it again. We looked at the differences between Ebola and Corona and looked at the CDC guidance, looked at the World Health Organization guidance documents and tried to put a concise report together that was not complicated, that people could understand and I, I qualify it by saying that it's a fluid document mm -hmm. because it, things are changing so fast. And in fact, it just got published like three or four days ago. Right. Is that correct? It's online now. That's right. Yes. That's correct. Yeah. So if I were going to ask you to give me a, you know, a 30-second elevator speech that mm -hmm. you're going to give to the public on how they can psychologically deal yeah. with this crisis, yeah. what would that be? They need to go on with life. They need to think logically. They need to use the guidance that they're hearing. It's not going to be easy. We've got science following us. We can develop vaccines. We can develop treatments. We've got great laboratory testing capabilities. Of course, that's being challenged, not because we don't have the capabilities, it's because we don't have the necessary reagents to run the tests. But developing a vaccine in 9, 12 months, 18 months is what I'm hearing, yeah. that's unheard of. Yeah. You know, back, back you know, with, with the original vaccines, it took years to develop right. it. So right. I think that we've got the capabilities to do these things. This particular lab is what we call the extraction room. So in this particular room, when we receive the swabs, the nasopharyngeal swabs, we would then take the swab using this instrument right here, which is a biological safety cabinet. We would do the extractions, uh, or we would, we would prepare the sample for extraction, and then we would put them on one of these automated extraction machines. So the first step of our process would be to get the, the uh, molecular uh, material out of the clinical sample. And once that has been completed in this room, 
then we basically have a sample that is completely killed and we don't have to worry about viability of virus or whatever. Um, to do that process, we actually use um, a little more containment with personal protective equipment in this particular room. It's not a level three facility, but it's, we use level three practices Got in it. here. When coronavirus became an issue, um, we work with a parent organization called the Association of Public Health Labs, APHL, which is kind of a, a go between between us and the Centers for Disease Control. We had uh, 57 people that showed up in, in Omaha, and we were concerned about the ability to test that volume of people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the APHL um, called me up and says, you know what, we have some automated extractors that you can use that are validated to run on the kits that we were using, and we got those very quickly. So ASCP uh, works very closely with uh, APHL. In fact, they're one of yes. our most valued partners, and we want to thank our colleagues at APHL for really being proactive and supportive of moving nimbly and quickly to support you and others around this country. So once a specimen has been extracted, we bring that extractant down here, and then we put them on these instruments to detect whether the um, genetic material for coronavirus is present or not. Hi, I'm Amanda Bartling. I'm a research technologist here at the Nebraska Public Health Lab. Um, currently, we are dealing with coronavirus. We're extracting, getting RNA, and then, um, as Pete was explaining, we are doing our PCR, which amplifies it to detect whether we have that specific RNA in these samples that we're getting in. They've worked really long hours, haven't you? Yeah. Um, we're going to get a day off, maybe, coming up. Mm -hmm. I, I told them they too. could take this a day off this weekend. But you've been working about three to four weekends, seven days a week since right. this coronavirus thing started. Mm -hmm. These are our results, our final results on the screen here. Basically, anytime you have a line that's coming up, like we can see those lines coming up there, it's considered a positive result. And the screen line going across is what we call our threshold. So that's determining whether if a line is above it, it's positive, And if it's below it, it's considered negative. So when we look at cycles here, we're looking at cycles where if the, if the molecular signature is there, it's going to amplify. It's going to go 1, 2, 4, 16. Mm -hmm. So we're up whatever it is, 10 to the 7th or 10 mm -hmm. to the 8th uh, products when we're all said and done. And these then, the fluorescence, the machines themselves, the sensors will detect that type of a signature. And that's what you're seeing right with that graph is you're seeing the detection of that uh, signature. Yep.